So before I begin, I want to talk about a bit of a personal story. So it's about a young high school girl from who originated from Guatemala. I've known her for a couple of months now, so she moved in recently into my area. And she's really comfortable speaking with like another native Spanish speaker. So she visits my home frequently to speak to my mother. And it's really nice to see her because she's like really intelligent. She's very dedicated to her studies, even though she has like a very reserved personality. But like despite her great qualities, she's undocumented. And you know, like with the recent events of deportation, I kinda of wonder one day that when I come back home, seeing used to her like used to seeing her having a nice conversation with my mother, she won't be there. And when she can't be deported, I'll never see her again. It's hard with, like, even though she's a very hard working person. So I kind of speculate on how that just affects her as an immigrant, but also as a student, especially that she's establishing a new home here in California. So, so from leading this uh, discussion, I want to talk about having an undocumented student actually leads to a fear of deportation. Now having that fear of deportation actually induces stress levels, and those stress levels can actually um, cause severe health issues. So before I continue, I want to talk about some of the background information. So the four categories of immigration status here in the country include U.S. citizen, permanent international residents, non-immigrant visas, and then undocumented. But today I want to primarily focus on the undocumented population. So regarding the undocumented population here in the U.S., in 2014, around 11 million um, undocumented immigrants are here in the U.S. And every year, 65,000 undocumented students are actually graduating from high school. As for, re as for their most recent location in 2014, and according to the 11 million population, 28% actually came from California, 13% from Texas, 8% from New York, 5% from Florida, and then 46% from other states from across the nation. As for their country in origin in 2009, where it was recorded at 7.8 million inhabited um, in the United States, 71% came from Mexico and Central America, 14% from Asia, 6% from South America, 5% from Europe, and then 4% from Africa, and then 3% from the Caribbean area as well. So, so one of the federal policies for education, in 1982, there was a Playa vs. Doe um, case, which is a Supreme Court case that actually allowed um, free access of K-12 education for undocumented students. Now, in colleges, um, currently, um, what's happening with college students, um, in 18 states, um, you now provide in-state tuition for undocumented college students, so it provides a huge advantage of paying um, in-state tuition versus out-of-state tuition. Now first, my first point of discussion, I want to talk about how having a document status actually leads to fear of deportation. Now with the current events of deportation, there's the Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or also known as ICE. So for some of you who haven't heard, um, actually a federal agency here in the United States, in order to detain and deport those who have no residency and suspicion of criminal activity. Now, so the numbers of deportation, you can see there's been a large amount of deportation during primarily due to um, the Obama administration. But I want to focus more in 2012 alone, where over 400,000 immigrants were actually being, um, deported. And 55% are actually considered convicted criminals, and 45% are actually considered non-criminal non -criminal immigration members. So you can see such a high quantity numbers of immigrants being deported can, ca can cause huge awareness and panic for the undocumented health community here in the United States. Now what is the impact of deportation? can actually cause fear of discovery about their illegal status. And because of that, these undocumented students have a feel really self-conscious about their identity. And because of they have um, self-conscious about their identity, and we start to realize how much of a risk they are of uh, being deported, and start to develop trust issues about who, who can or who they can't communicate with regarding their status. Because the wrong kind of communication and the wrong kind of person can eventually call immigration services towards them. That's when I first study, I want to talk about um, Brazilian students in Boston, we were the ages around 15 to 18. And there were 42 participated in the interviews, and then 14 um, admitted to be undocumented, and they shared their experiences and struggles of being undocumented in, here in the country. There was also a second study conducted with Salvadorian students in Los Angeles. Where 24 undocumented students interviewed, and they also shared their experiences and struggles of being undocumented. So some of the common themes between all the interview questions and answers is that these students were really uncomfortable and then really reluctant of talking about their illegal status towards those who are a different cultural or ethical background, which kind of makes sense, kind of like a defense mechanism towards those of who you're not comfortable with. Well, there was one, um, one anecdote from the Brazilian study that stood out to me the most. Her thighs, she's age 18, and she says, the first thing I remember my counselor asking, so how is your status? And I was like, oh, I'm in a process. I lied because I don't want to say, like, I'm undocumented. I don't know, he probably would have looked at me in a different way. So I was like, I'm in a process. 
So you can start, you can start to see some of uh, the trust issues that these students start to develop. Because they're unsure that the raw communication can eventually um, call immigration services, and it can be the end of their educational opportunities. So I first discussed how having a document status leads to fear of deportation, and I'll be discussing how that induces stress levels, and how stress levels can actually um, cause severe health issues for these types of students. Now before I continue, I want to establish that there's actually not a lot of quantitative data regarding the health issues of undocumented students. That is because there's such a conservative population that they're not really open for medical testing. So you could say, oh, how could I possibly conclude that they're undergoing um, these severe health issues? Well, I decided to do a comparison study with a parallel group who undergo similar experiences of suffering and then uh, prejudice from other people. So the group I decided to do a comparison with the study of undocumented students is with in-closet gay men. Now, what are some of the similarities of in closet gay men and undocumented students? It happens to be that both both groups have a fear of discovery regarding their identity. And because that need to hide their identity uh, is the sign of a defense mechanism, because they're afraid of how people will react, or it could be prejudice, or it could just uh, reject them. And also starting to induce social stigma that these people, because they have their identity, start to feel frustrated with themselves, because they feel so uncomfortable with their own qualities or uh, their own qualities are making people dislike them or possibly reject them. So my first study, which take, took part in the late 1980s, was after the AIDS epidemic um, in the United States. There was an interview of 700, 741 gay men. And then they described their experiences of minority stressors, which included internalized homophobia, stigma, and prejudice. And the results of that study demonstrated that over 75% reported these experiences of minority stressors, such as internalized homophobia, Sigma and prejudice. Now, the effect of these stressors can actually lead to psychological distress, which can lead to severe anxiety and depression. So, it can affect your, um, your daily interaction if you're not functioning properly because, like, you're so self conscious about who you are and how that actually hurts you. Now, while I discuss some of the psychological impacts of these stressors, I want to talk about the physiological impacts, which is something not a lot of people know. So, in terms of physiological effects of stress, it actually suppresses the nervous system and the immune function. And because of that, you're actually at increased risk for diseases. If your immune function is not working properly, you're more prone for disease and illness. <coughs> so from my second study, um, in 1986, there was a study of 222 HIV seronegative men and bisexual men. And some reported to be in closet, some out of closet. So identities were anonymous. But I actually found out that those who identified as in closet gays were three times more likely to develop cancer. You started to realize how those who were in closet, their immune function was not working properly compared to those who were out of the closet. But not just more likely to develop cancer, but actually three times more higher risk for infectious diseases. And these diseases also include pneumonia, bronchitis, pneumonitis, and also tuberculosis. It's pretty incredible to realize how much you're, uh, you're prone to these kind of diseases just because of stress levels. So for my analysis, how I discuss how in closet gays individuals um, also partake the fear of discovery, and also discuss about the psychological distress. As I demonstrated before here in the evidence, actually had a huge impact on your health. As for undocumented students, we actually see the same comparison of fear of discovery and then that memory goes psychological distress. So while there's not quantitative data for um, undocumented students, we can actually conclude that there's a parallel, parallel um, outcome for undocumented students, that they're really prone to these stress levels, and these stress levels can actually um, suppress their immune function. And because of that, there are more prone to diseases, like as I mentioned, pneumonia, bronchitis, and et cetera, even cancer, throughout their whole lifetime, just depending on how much they hydrate them. You know, why is this all important? Well, it is our duty here as classmates, as counselors or professors, to do so. Uh, we support students regardless if they're um, undergoing suffrage, any kind of suffering or mental torture. It is our duty to support them. And if we do support them and eventually uh, become comfortable with one, with one another, Establishing these social skills and communication skills that can actually increase your success rate. Because in higher education, you're required to have a set of communication skills. Whereas, whether you need a letter of recommendation or a job interview, you're required to be very talkative and very communicative with one another. And, if that, and these students are able to reach that level of professionalism, whether it's a, um, a career or a higher um, educational institution, they can actually benefit the economy if they earn um, wages. They can actually put that back in their system. But most importantly, it's about the act of kindness and compassion that we should consider. We are human beings and we sympathize with those who undergo um, any kind of suffering. Especially for these students who are willing to mentally torture themselves just for better educational opportunities. We can practically call them like um, 
compared to like U.S. citizens, who are really hardworking and dedicated to grasp all sorts of opportunities. We can really call them as Americans to be honest, because like they're so hardworking and dedicated. Well, what's the difference between um, undocumented students and then those who are legal? It's just paperwork. They have the same intentions, just like anyone else here. Thank you. I'd like to open up the floor for questions. Okay, I, I have a, a quick question. I don't know if you maybe, um, throughout your research, have you noticed maybe uh, the graduation rates due to the students facing this in a younger childhood education? Like, uh, were, they the, were they able to graduate high school? Even, like, you know, like, what was some of the consequences on that because of all of this? So it's actually not, um, the data didn't necessarily connect towards graduation rates, that's more towards the financial needs. So some of these students are really disadvantaged in terms of like out-of-state tuition, which is why such a small percentage actually attend college. But it's not, most of it's just speculation and like, um, just like a hypothesis that if you're undergoing these kinds of stress and you're not motivated enough, you're probably not gonna reach a higher education. It's like you have to be really communicative and you don't wanna be communicative because you start to be less, well, you communicate with the wrong people, it can have some severe consequences. So it was not really connected towards the fear, it's more about um, the financial um, financial dependency for the Yes? Just more of a comment, but uh, your sto uh, the, the story of that you started out with just certainly resonated with me, but uh, I had a student that was uh, looking forward to moderate um, for this conference, and she had been looking forward to this day. And, uh, she was so afraid of going through the uh, checkpoint at uh, Camp Pendleton that uh, she wasn't able to uh, participate in today. And so she had to go through all that strength and uh, stress and worry and doubt and emails. And we've been doing this for the last three weeks. And so I just want to show you another qualitative example of the sort of uh, reactive uh, circumstances that these students are feeling. Yes. Um, do you feel that your campus has provided the undocumented community uh, proper resources to relieve some stress? I feel because um, most of the undocumented population consists of a Hispanic and Latino. So I feel like on campus we have like a lot of Hispanic and you know, cultural Latino clubs. So I feel like the first step would be for these undocumented students to speak of those who are the same cultural background. Like you have to be like Guatemalan, Brazilian, but still like the same kind of Cultural similarities. So I feel like that's the first step as to these undocumented students being comfortable with those who are of a close um, cultural background. And we also have um, students who aren't necessarily Hispanic or Latino, like in these kinds of clubs. And I feel like that's a huge gateway for these students to be more comfortable speaking with those who aren't necessarily like, of the same background. Yes. Um, you, you, um, you've brought across that the oppression towards the undocumented. Uh, people are, are bad, it is bad. How, how do you propose a solution to that problem? A solution is kind of, um, what I mentioned before, is having these, um, cultural, these cultural clubs. You're not gonna have like an undocumented like club. Just gonna call ice right now. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, part of, that's one of the biggest problems. Um, what many theories and what many researchers say that if we have like a cultural club, and you see us most likely go with those who are similar back. That's kind of like the first step. But as for that, there's nothing like really direct. It's more like a like a stepping stone, take like one step at a time. Um, I have um, time for one more question. I just uh, want to say it's presentation, and um, I do see a lot of uh, lack of interest in students fulfilling their education because they have this attitude about before, you know. I'm, I'm, I've been deported, so why even try? So the, I see that lack of motivation, and, and some don't even start community college or university because of that. So, uh, so there is a high school level that way because of that. And then once they're at community college or universities, uh, that they're still struggling with that. They're still like, okay, so I get a degree here, I can't work here anyway. So, so what, what for? So thank you very much. Thank you.